It's a lump of crystal. You know the old adage as well as I do, Roundhead said. Artifacts with sufficiently advanced technology will seem to work by magic to an observer who does not possess that technology. Yes, Senior conceded. But lumps of floating crystal doesn't just seem like magic. It is magic. Roundhead didn't argue. She just continued smiling and staring at the shard. It's going to take days to get the machinery rigged up to the crystal again, Xenia added ruefully. It sounded like some delicate and expensive stuff broke when you did your little parlor trick. Why would we want to do that? Roundhead asked. Xenia shot a confused glance at Roundhead, trying to work out why they wouldn't want to immediately reconnect the shard and continue extracting information and learning its secrets. But we need the apparatus, Senia said. Without it, how would we continue to extract information? I'm glad you asked, Roundhead said, obviously enjoying herself enormously. Allow me to demonstrate. Xenia nodded her approval, the grin of pleasure on Roundhead's face making her unable to feel any irritation at the theatrics Roundhead was employing. Roundhead this time said more than one word. She said a whole sentence, maybe two. It was difficult for Xenia to say, as the grammar of this ancient form of Terezin seemed quite different to the modern version. In response to Roundhead's words, the shard became more luminous, so luminous that beams of light emerged, but only from the facets facing them. The beams then fractured, as if each beam was a pane of glass suddenly hit by a hammer. Shafts of pure light were sent spinning through the room. Xenia tried to watch the trajectory of one of the shafts, and saw it fly in a wide spiral, before combining with another. Suddenly, all the shafts were combining. Then Xenia noticed that the surface being formed was as reflective as a mirror. She saw herself and the roundhead's dark lab reflected there. And then something else. A different place, like the bridge of a spaceship, or the control room of a space station. She felt, or imagined, she wasn't sure, a physical lurch, and she and Roundhead were standing in the control room. Xenia nodded appreciatively. Nice, she said. So it has a memory core, a gravitic drive, and a hologram projector. That does make it much more portable and useful. It is a very good quality hologram, Roundhead said, isn't it? I guess so, Xenia said. But we can build miniaturized hologram projectors with our present level of technology. They aren't as magical as the... Xenia's words trailed off as she swiped her fingers across the top of a nearby console. Instead of her fingers penetrating it, as they should have if it had been simply a hologram, they stopped. Stopped by a hard surface. She took a step back in superstitious fear and drew her pistol from a small holster at her hip. Whoa, Roundhead called out, raising two open hands in a gesture of surrender. Don't shoot. What in the powers is going on, Xenia yelled. Holograms aren't solid. Solid holograms are magic, pure and simple. I mean, if you can create solid holograms, why bother with reality? It just didn't... Xenia's words trailed off again as she noticed an amused, raised eyebrow, just visible through Roundhead's visor. To a primitive culture, like ours, any artifact created by a sufficiently... Xenia started to say, but Roundhead interrupted her. Magic, she whispered. The buzzer scientist was hanging in the briny chemical soup that was the moon's subterranean ocean. It was extremely cold, and what was worse, it was very effective at conducting heat away from the scientist's large, metal, crab-like body. She had specifically hardened herself against the cold, designed her internal systems to be well insulated, and her biological components to be well protected, but it was still a challenge. It was made a lot more bearable, however, by the progress she was making. Her hunch had turned out to be right. The ice tomb complex sent tendrils of technology through the ice-like roots, and some of them even extended into the open water like long, growths of seaweed swaying with the ocean currents. There was, she guessed based on what she had seen so far, an order of magnitude, more massive drifter technology hidden below the ice than protruded from the top of the moon's highest mountain. The largest drifter site visible on the surface was nothing compared to all this technology hidden below the surface. Alert! The soldier to her right sent over the comms channel. Visual contact! A large aquatic life form! 
I will remind you, the scientist said, leaving nothing to chance, that the creatures are not to be engaged without my express permission. Remember, you are all designated as expendable. Confirmed, came the squad commander's voice. The scientist strained the clusters of sensors within her dark and vacant eye sockets, trying to see the beast directly. But it was impossible. There was just too much ocean medium, a briny and murky mix of chemicals between her and the creature. Piggybacking, she said, as she requested the optical data from the warrior nearest the creature. Confirmed, the warrior said, allowing her access. She was now seeing through the warrior's eyes, and it was an interesting experience in itself. His sensors were much more suited to resolving large structures at a distance than hers were. His eyes were simply sharper, and there was a crosshairs painted on the feed. It was hovering over the creature, the targeting computer built into the warrior's mind working to keep the sights on the center of its mass. The scientist had no doubt that if she gave the warrior the command to fire his unwieldy mass driver, it would be very difficult to miss such a huge and slow-moving target. She found herself wondering how the creature would react to being struck by such a powerful weapon, and she found herself hoping she wouldn't have to find out. It's moving out of range, the warrior said, and the scientist saw in the image he was sharing that the creature was gradually fading away into the murk again, and then, with a leisurely flick of the tail, it was gone. Fantastic, the scientist mumbled. Squad commander, send that footage back to my team in the complex. I'd be interested to hear their opinions. Impossible, the squad commander told her, his voice firm. We are now over two miles from our insertion point, and our comms are extended almost to breaking point. We just don't have the bandwidth to squirt video to them. Audio only. The scientist swiveled her head so she could look at the squad commander, floating in the murky darkness of the subterranean ocean. Our projections were that we could scout out to five miles from the insertion point with little or no degradation in comm signals, she said. Unfortunately, the squad commander told her, our projections were very optimistic. There was considerable interference and comms degradation is severe. We are actually using more comms relay floats than we projected already. Excellent, the scientist whispered to herself. Excellent? The buzzers rarely inflected their voices, preferring to show emotions via pheromone emission or by injecting interference into the comms. But the bandwidth was so reduced the squad commander had no other option. He sounded confused. Don't you see, she replied. The interference... It has to be coming from something or from somewhere. This place is alive. Understood was the warrior's only response. He obviously didn't care to consider the implications. All he was interested in was assimilating fresh, tactical parameters. The scientist turned back to her examination of the cliff face of ice she was clinging to. The question now was whether they should press on with their examination or pause to transfer data to base camp and get an update on how much longer they had before the swarm commander thought the next wave of human attacks might come, forcing them to suspend their work. We have to continue, the scientist said, but we also have to get the data I've already collected back to base camp. This eventuality was foreseen, the squad commander said. Your preparations allow for sending a warrior back as a messenger if communications become difficult. One of her warriors was selected, and the squad commander dumped an enormous quantity of data into his memory before he set off across the vertical ice, heading back to their insertion point. The warriors left behind reacted by tightening their cordon around her a little and repositioning so that two warriors were above her on the wall and one was below her, in a kind of protective triangle, while the squad commander stayed where he was, floating out in open water, protecting her back. Alert, came a warning from a warrior above her and to her right. Visual contact, aquatic creature. Again, the scientist strained her eyes and again she failed to see anything. She was forced to piggyback on the warrior's optic feed. It was a bigger creature this time, the size of a small starship, a freighter perhaps. It was swimming lazily towards them, but lost interest before it actually reached them. Instead, it dived almost directly down. As it dived, the warrior's optical feed gave her the best view of it she had managed yet. It was dark in color, possibly black, but it was difficult to tell in these light conditions, and it had four eyes, 
a pair on each side of its head. Three of the eyes were like little orbs of amber, but one was cloudy and red, like a glass full of human blood. The scientist counted six stubby aquatic limbs in a tapering tail as the creature powered away downwards. I see something down there, the warrior at the lowest point of the protective triangle said. A mass of systems, perhaps, or a vehicle, maybe a settlement. Range, the squad commander demanded. Rangefinder is glitching, the warrior said. I estimate five miles, at least. Five miles, the scientist whispered, considering the fact that it was just at the maximum agreed distance for their first exploratory dive. We have to take a look. Chapter 8 Alti and Nave were back in the shuttle, and the craft was coming to a higher state of alertness around them. The shuttle had gone into a sort of sleep mode while they were outside, even though they had only been gone for less than an hour, but now it was coming awake. Indicator lights across numerous systems came blinking on as the ship adjusted to their presence. While the ship was waking up, Alti and Nave both stripped off their heavy coats and stowed them back away in the lockers. They started walking through the few short corridors between them and the bridge. So, Nafe said, now you've seen it. This is the planet that spawned me. It's time we did what we came here to do, isn't it? Altia asked. Nave nodded, his expression pensive. Can we just drop in on him? Altia asked. How long is it since you saw your brother last? A long time, he admitted. But just dropping in on him? Isn't that too dangerous? Altia could see that he was tempted. No, she said. I don't think so. If we get into any trouble with local law enforcement, we'll just call Jay. The drifter ship can be here in less than half an hour. So quickly? Nay raised an eyebrow in surprise. Sure, she replied. It can just lift into orbit on gravitics, then dive down on our present location, in a huge arcing maneuver like a scramjet. Sure, Nave said, rubbing the back of his neck. I guess that makes sense. But it's not like we can just ring him up and tell him we're coming. No, Altsy agreed with an ironic grin. Calling him on an open comms channel would be a bad idea. So we'll just have to drop in, Nave said, and paused a while, weighing up the likelihood of capture by the Empire against his desire to see his brother. By the time they had arrived at the bridge, he had made his decision. Okay, let's do it. It's the whole reason we're here, after all. We didn't come all this way just to take a romantic walk on the beach. Woohoo, Altia yelped and jumped into the shuttle's pilot seat. Woohoo, Nave said with a raised eyebrow, as he slid into the co-pilot seat, making no effort to hide his suspicion at her uncharacteristic and sudden enthusiasm. Yeah, she nudged him in the ribs. We're going to meet your family, or at least your brother, so woohoo. That's the first time anybody ever said woohoo at the thought of meeting my family, Nave mumbled. The shuttle was flying over the outskirts of his hometown within 20 minutes, and they didn't have to wait long for permission to land. The town's shuttle port was far from busy. It wasn't enormously inviting either, just a huge area of concrete, lashed by wind and rain and lacking either a comfortable passenger terminal or even a control tower. That's a pretty basic landing pad the town has, Alti observed, as she brought the shuttle down on gravitics. Yeah, Nave said and it's exactly the same as the last time I saw it. Except, it's in even more dire need of maintenance. It used to be a bus station, you know. They just bulldozed the shelters, reinforced the surface, and put a fence around it. It didn't sound very likely to Altia, but the place was so primitive, she could see where the story had come from. The sensors on the landing gear reported unstable terrain and recommended finding another place to set down. This can't be right, can it? Altia asked. Just ignore it, Nave told her. This is where all the shuttles land. It's safe enough. The place was built to just below minimum standards, but that's because some sort of innovative new technology makes it possible to get more performance out of crappy building materials, apparently. Really? Altia was intrigued despite herself. She overrode the safety systems that were complaining about the unstable terrain and initiated the landing sequence. No, Nave snorted in amusement. Nobody believed it at the time. Now it's painfully obvious it's just a substandard facility, built on the cheap by corrupt politicians and banded corporations. You'd be better off landing in a freshly plowed field. 
The rain was falling even harder by the time they disembarked. The shuttle's ramp was mounted on the underside of the craft, just rear of the center, so they were sheltered from the driving rain by the bulk of the shuttle above them. Under the canopy of their own shuttle, they could see that the rain was already streaming off the upper surfaces of the craft and falling all around them in small waterfalls. It looks like the only dry spot on this planet is under the shuttle, Altia mumbled. There is an advantage to this weather, Nave told her, almost cheerfully. The kind of crappy cameras used around here have a lot of trouble seeing through it, and you can forget facial recognition. Well, okay, Altia said, enthusiasm returning to her voice. Some good news. Let's get to where we're going before this downpour stops. This way, Nave said, a half-smile playing on his lips. They traveled across several open expanses of concrete, often strewn with detritus that hadn't been cleaned away, a busted robot here, a kitchen unit there. Then came tunnels, dripping with leaks, lights, and advertising flickering as water got into the systems and encrusted in the corners with filth. At last, they emerged into the town center, an endless array of huge housing blocks with businesses on the ground floor, if you could call them businesses. It was mostly a collection of frighteningly run-down drinking holes. We need Tower 350H, Nave said, unless he's moved. Moved, Altius said, straining to hear above the roar of the rain hitting concrete all around. With my brother? That's unlikely, Nave said, but you never know. Nave's brother, Merton, lived in a tiny apartment that consisted, as far as Altia could tell, of a bathroom, a hallway, and another room that was used for all other functions. It contained a sofa bed, coffee table, hologram entertainment center, and kitchen, and it was the only area with a window, a relatively narrow strip of glass that gave a glimpse of daylight, but could hardly be said to afford a view. Altia was genuinely shocked. She'd stayed in equally cramped quarters on a dig or when in transit on a spaceship sometimes, but she hadn't realized people actually lived this way in their homes. It just didn't fit with what she imagined Terrazit to be, and certainly didn't fit with what she wanted new Terrazit to become. When the revolution is over, nobody will have to live this way, she said. Merton raised an eyebrow with that, a little nonplussed, while Nave looked diplomatically away. It's not that bad, this place, Merton said defensively. Quite modern. With a good draft exclusion system and heating I can regulate myself. A lot of these blocks have communal heating, set by the council. You have no control over the temperature of your own apartment. I'm quite proud of this place, actually. Oh, Altia said. Um, don't worry, Merton said, a little rueful now. I know what you mean. It must look like a shithole to an off-worlder. I just mean there's people who are much worse off than me. Of course, Altia said. Drink? Merton offered. Hell yes, Nave replied. Why not? Altia nodded, and Merton went over to the corner of the room that served as his kitchen. In pride of place, there was a very modern food synthesizer. Nice unit, Nave said appreciatively, as Merton hit one of his preset menus. The machine produced three glasses of some dark and murky liquid. Merton put them on the coffee table and took a seat in the sort of chair often bought to enjoy hologram entertainments from. A big, deeply upholstered swivel chair in beige leather. It was one of the most hideous things Altia had ever seen in her entire life. She and Nave sat side by side on the sofa and she lifted the drink suspiciously to the light. It's called Yabro, Merton told her. It's the local hooch. You can't visit Vain Tempest without trying it. Watch out, Nave told her. It's potent. To prodigal sons, Merton said. Glasses clinked, and they drank. Altia enjoyed watching Nave and Merton swapping stories, catching up. It was an hour into the local meeting, and three of the potent local drinks later before Merton brought up something more serious. I knew you'd be dropping by, Merton said. You did? Nave was a little surprised because, until the last minute, he had been far from sure he would drop in on his brother. You want to know how I did? Merton asked. Sure, Altia said, sensing something behind his words, something they needed to know. A guy came by, Merton said, after a short hesitation and a sip from his glass. A bounty hunter. His name was Kerr. Both Altia and Nave nodded and leaned forward. Nave took a sip of his drink. This guy, Merton continued, 
this bounty hunter. He said he would give me a lot of money if I handed you over to him. He'd probably give me even more if I also gave him one of your, um, associates. We're together, Nave said. You're in a lot of trouble is what you are, Merton said, his voice sharp. I wouldn't hand you over for all the rock on Tempest, but you know as well as I do that there are plenty around here who would. Nave nodded, his expression dark. When did this bounty hunter contact you, Altia asked. A while ago, Merton told her, and I doubt I was the only one he tried his sales pitch on. If you get made by a camera or a drone, my guess is Kerr will know about it even before Imperial law enforcement does. If we get made, Nave said. And in rain this heavy, the cameras and drones can see through the rain, believe me, Merton interrupted. People already know you're here. So the question is, Altia said, how long have we got before we have to be on our way? You've probably already stayed too long, Merton said, face sad. But before you go, I want you to tell me about this revolution. I'll get a better house, you say? Yes, Altia said. Everyone will live better in New Tarazid. And we, Nave said, need to know more about the dark heart of the Empire. It was a few hours more before Altia and Nave took their leave of Merton and headed back to the shuttle port. They retraced their steps between the housing blocks, through the tunnels, and across blasted wasteland towards the expanse of concrete where they had left their shuttle. At last they arrived, and they saw the craft up ahead, a milky gray shadow among the sheets of rain. They were walking quickly, side by side, heads down against the driving wind and rain, when Nay felt a familiar sensation. It felt like oil spreading over his skin. It started at his chest, where his armor badge was, and spread across the surface of his body. He glanced at Altia and saw a fountain of metal, burst from the chest of her waterproof jacket, but the metal wasn't liquid. It was a complex, unfolding whirl of hexagonal metal scales. They quickly spread across her body, covering her, forming a suit of insectile power armor. The feeling of oil spreading meant the same thing was happening to him. He was being covered by the hyper-advanced suit of armor he had been provided with by the ship's computer on Galaxy Dog. Intellectually, Nave knew the process was lightning fast, and that he could only see the details of it because of the time dilation effects the armor somehow brought with it. He saw the sheets of rain slow, and turn into curtains of individual drops as time slowed for him. Altia would, he knew, be experiencing the same slowing of time. Then came the mental connection. He started to be able to hear Altia's thoughts and transmit information to her directly from his mind, as their two armor suits connected his mind directly with hers. The armor only reacts when we're being shot at, Nave thought, secure in the knowledge that the thought was being transmitted to Altia without him having to say a word. An ambush? Her thoughts came in reply. And then the shots started to hit them. Blaster bolts, calibrated to stun. Altia was hit by four or five of them, while Nave was hit by ten or more. Most of the shots were coming from behind them, but some of the shots were coming from up ahead. Without the armor, they would have both immediately fallen face down in the water, unconscious. But with their armor deployed, the stun bolts had about as much effect as the rain. I can't see them, Nave said, frustration in his voice as he reached for his gun. He glanced at Altia and saw that she was also arming herself. A block of bronze, little bigger than a personal communicator, was extruded through the armor into her hand and then underwent a transformation. It turned from a simple block into a pistol, which in turn was then encompassed by the armor, turning her right hand into a solid lump of bronze, traced over in hexagonal seams with a hole for the gun's muzzle. Can you see them? Nave asked her. Yes, she replied. There are two of them, and they have some drones with them. Use the suit sensors. They can cut through this rain. Um, okay, Nave replied. How exactly do I... Altia sent him images directly from her brain to show him how to summon the suit's visual sensors. Theoretically, it was a simple series of thoughts that were picked up by the suit, which then initiated the function. But Nave had never done it before, and he was shot a few more times before the rain faded from his vision, and the natural colors of the world around him were replaced by shades of bronze, gold, and silver. Suddenly, he could see the world around him, and he could see his attackers, crouched in cover while their drones advanced, firing as they came. Well, okay, Nave thought. Now we're talking. Tactics? Altia asked. A thought, in his own head, but recognizably hers. 
Ignore the drones. Target the two humans and take them out, Nafe said. Deadly force. Deadly force? Yeah, Nafe sent back over their telepathic connection. The only reason these guys have their guns on stun is because the Empire will pay more for us alive. They wouldn't think twice about killing us. Okay, agreed, came back Altia's answer. She targeted one of the crouching human figures and fired. The giant mobile capacitor she was hiding behind was a large and robust piece of machinery, but Altia's block gun, despite its small size, packed the punch of a military railgun. A prism of intense light appeared just beyond the muzzle of her pistol, the only sign that terrible forces were being gathered and focused by the weapon's mechanism. Then a giant hole was blasted in the side of the capacitor, spreading debris across the concrete of the landing pad and sending the man sheltering behind it sprawling backwards from the shock and impact of the detonation. Nave targeted the other man, tearing an enormous hunk of sheet metal from the cargo mover he was hiding behind. With their advantage from the time dilation effects their armor generated, Alti and Nave had fired a few more times before their opponents had started to react to their ambush failing. All the enemy weapons were switching from stun to kill, and the two humans crawled into better cover while the approaching drones increased their pace to a run. Okay, Nave thought, this changes things. The last thing we want is to get into a hand-to-hand -hand melee with all these drones. Agreed, Altia said. Retreat to the shuttle, targeting drones as we go. Sounds good, Nave agreed. But if you get the line of sight on one of our two human friends, don't hesitate to terminate the rat. When Altia's thought came in reply, it wasn't in the form of words, just an emotion, a feeling of agreement and acceptance that they were doing what they had to do. Then the drones started to fall as Nave and Altia switched to targeting them, the closest, most dangerous ones first. The drones weren't even military grade and didn't stand a chance against Nave and Altia's firepower. The drones' arms were torn off, heads blasted apart, and the machines were sent staggering away through the rain. The time dilation effects created by the armor were a huge advantage, but they didn't make Altia or Nave any faster than their opponents, and so their retreat to the shuttle seemed to take forever. Taking slow motion step, after slow motion step, through the frozen curtains of raindrops suspended in the air. Watching enemy weapons recoil and having to wait a second or two from their subjective experience of time before they knew if the shot would hit them or not. Both humans and all the drones had their weapons set to kill now, but even these kill shots from the light weapons their attackers were using were no threat to their drifter armor. Some of the better targeted shots did hurt, however, as some of the kinetic energy started getting through to their bodies to leave a bruise, and the armor wouldn't protect them from such a hail of fire forever. Luckily, the amount of incoming fire was decreasing rapidly. Every one of the humanoid-shaped drones they destroyed meant less fire coming at them, until only two drones were left, and both of their human attackers were running away through the rain as fast as they could. I have a great shot at this guy's back, Altia sent a picture of the rear of a retreating human torso to Nave. Somehow, though, I don't want to gun down a fleeing opponent. I know what you mean, Nave sent back. Seems wrong somehow, doesn't it? He's gone, Altia said, at last. They're both gone. The last two drones were now busted apart and scattered across the cheap concrete surface of the shuttle port, and the incoming fire had completely ceased. Yeah, Nave said. They just sacrificed their drones to cover their retreat. Nave and Altia hurried aboard their shuttle and lifted off. Kirk couldn't run anymore. He was sprawled on the soaking ground, rain hammering down on him, a giant hole torn in the armor on his thigh. The flesh below was singed and pitted and hurting like hell. It was amazing he had managed to run on it, something he put down to the adrenaline in his system and the cocktail of combat drugs he juiced himself with before they had sprung their ambush. The adrenaline and the drugs were rapidly leaving his system now, though, leaving him shaking and fighting as hard as he could not to scream. His accomplice, a local thug who went by the name of Tail Gunner, was standing a few steps away, under the relative shelter of the eaves of an equipment shed. That didn't go according to plan, did it? Tail Gunner observed. Well, thank you for stating the obvious, Kerr growled. He didn't have much patience for idiots at the best of times, but now he was in so much pain he was sorely tempted to just shoot this imbecile. Tailgunner didn't respond, instead just gazing at Kerr, who was still sprawled at his feet. Kerr grimaced and got up, shakily from the ground, 
putting his oversized pistol back in its holster as soon as he was standing. They're gone, Tailgunner said. Yeah, Kurt grunted. This time. Next time, I'll be ready for them. How? Tailgunner asked. Did you see how fast they reacted? It was crazy. Like nothing I've ever seen before, Kerr agreed. One minute, they were wearing stupid-looking wind cheaters. The next, they were in super-advanced combat armor. I nailed the guy a few times with this. He brandished his blaster carbine on kill three, and that's enough to penetrate the armor of a hardened vehicle. The guy didn't even notice. Yeah, he did, Kurt contradicted him. I saw him flinch, and one of my shots hit the woman in the shoulder articulation of her armor. Almost spun her around. I could tell she didn't like it. So you think we can get them, Tailgunner asked, if we try again? I think so, Kurt said. We'll need a few more drones and some heavy weapons, that's all. It's very doable. The big problem is intelligence. This was the perfect opportunity. Open ground. Nobody around. They weren't expecting us. And they weren't supported by their spaceship. That is not going to be easy to engineer a second time. Damn near impossible, Tailgunner said. We'll see, Kerr mumbled, as he started limping off through the rain with a grunt of pain. We'll see. The drifter ship was lancing through the atmosphere, Alti and Nave now on board and intent on putting some distance between themselves and Vane Tempest. The rain slackened and stopped as they climbed above the clouds, then the atmosphere disappeared completely as they emerged into planetary orbit. There is a carrier and a couple of escorts out there, Jay told Alti and Nave as they joined him on the bridge. They're moving to intercept, though they are no match for this ship. I guess... They must have been told to keep us in system as long as possible, to give some swift destroyers time to arrive. Where did they come from? Nave asked. They must have been on Dark Watch, Jay told him, hiding in the asteroid belt or the Oort cloud, powered down and doing passive scans. Can we get out of here without engaging them? Altia asked. Yort, Jay said, passing the question on to the ship's computer. There are numerous exit vectors that will take us out of this system without offering the approaching spaceships any chance of an intercept, Yort told them. Choose one at random and do it, Nave said. Confirmed, Yort said. The stars on the main screen seemed to lurch as the spaceship accelerated and changed vector, and a few moments later started to accelerate even more as they began to transition to light speed. Well, Altia said, rubbing her shoulder, where one blaster bolt had really caught her, now that I've seen your home planet, I guess you should see mine. Why? Nave asked. My father, she told him. Your brother told us about the new shipyards they're building at the Empire's Dark Heart, and my father is a shipyard designer. If anyone can tell us how to get in unobserved, it's him. Chapter 9 they was gazing at an unusual pulsar that shone at wavelengths visible to the human eye. It was creating beautiful chiaroscuro effects on its surrounding debris disk. As the spaceship edged closer and radiation from the pulsar climbed, the viewport suddenly decided to block most of the light coming from outside. Instead of a transparent panel, he was suddenly gazing into a mirror, where he saw the three of them reflected, himself, Altia, and Jay. All three were standing, Jay in his usual position right next to the window. He was a towering presence, especially in the foreground of the view. He was two meters tall and slim, with a body that seemed to be constructed mostly of bronze rods and silver bands. Altia stood in the middle of the floor, and Nave's eyes traveled to her next. She was a dark-skinned black woman with natural hair, and the bronze sheen of the hologram she was staring at picked out the contours of her face beautifully. She was standing right by the hologram, projected from a system mounted in the ceiling above her, examining a detail of the data presented there. It was a ribbon of alien-looking script, a segment of drifter writing. Of the three of them, only Altia could decrypt and translate the writing without aid. Nave's eyes then traveled to himself, at the back, having just gotten up from one of the sofas to refill his drink. He was the most physically powerful-looking of the three, with wide shoulders and a muscular neck. 
He was pretty sure they'd somehow gotten growth hormones into him during military basic training, without bothering to get his consent, because he'd gone into the Navy pretty scrawny and came out more muscular. He had light brown skin and epicanthic folds, and the bronze lighting of the room was very flattering to him too, he had to admit. The three of them, at that moment, looked like the tightest, closest of groups, almost a family. And then the blast shield lifted as they passed out of the danger zone of the pulsar, and the mirror was gone. All he could see now was infinity, the stars, the future. Hagan was walking alongside Shivia as she led the way into the section of the base he had been previously barred from. As you can see, she said, there is no contamination here. This was just a ruse to keep my treasures secret, until I was ready to reveal them. So you're ready to reveal them now? Hagan asked. Shivia led the way into a huge space, obviously carved out of the asteroid interior, based on the rough finish of the walls. Although it was very clearly a laboratory, with numerous huge devices, vats of viscous liquid and robot manipulator arms, it also looked a little like a hospital ward. There were two rows of five beds each, arrayed down the center of the room. Three of the beds had unconscious human occupants, two women and a man. Each one was surrounded by three or four antiseptic-looking hospital robots, their body panels covered in white plastic. The robots were monitoring drug administration devices, hovering above the beds on gravitic drives. Hagan glanced at Shivia, and she saw the concern in his eyes. As I told you, she said, these subjects are not the victims of disease, infection, or virus. They are my latest breakthrough. They are quite safe, I promise you. She could feel Hagan's sense of relief radiating from him in waves. Go on over and take a closer look, Shivya said. They are quite fascinating. Hagan nodded and went over to the nearest bed. The hospital robots and their various devices moved aside to allow him to see the woman lying there. She was covered in thick, coarse, white hospital blankets, all except her head, which had been shaved. The top of her head was a mass of scar tissue with various hoses and cables emerging from it. There was a lot of cybernetics within. He could see that through ports in the skin, and the skin at the center of the scarred area was very gray. What happened to her? Is she unconscious? Hagan asked. Shivia smiled and came over to join him at the woman's bedside. If by unconscious you mean dead, then yes, she said. She's dead? Hagan mumbled. Then why all this effort to rebuild her head? Once the spark of life has been extinguished, it can never be reintroduced. That superstitious nonsense, Shivia said. And I'm not reconstructing the head, I'm modifying it. To what purpose? Have you ever lost a valued member of staff, Admiral Hagan? She asked. A member of staff with irreplaceable knowledge and skills. I'm an admiral in the Navy during a time of almost constant warfare, Hagan said. It's something that happens over and over again. What if you could have that member of staff back, Shivia said. That would be a boon, Hagan said. But you can't really be telling me you were capable of resurrecting my fallen warriors, can you? Actually, Shivia said, I am. But this procedure requires a body in almost pristine condition to be successful. We can't bring everyone back. The more damage the body has received, the more unpredictable the results when I grabbed Z-Mass. Z-Mass? Hagan raised an eyebrow. The gray area at the crown of the head, Shivya pointed. A small amount of material is harvested from the Z-forms you brought me, Admiral, and applied to the scalp. Its processes are carefully monitored and controlled as it brings the body back to life. The Z-Mass is the engine that resurrects our recently departed comrade in arms. Hagan took a step back from the bed, with Shivya's eyes following him, watching him intently. He felt a wave of revulsion rise within him. Something about the idea just seemed wrong. He couldn't say exactly what his reservations were, but he knew he had them. But, he eventually said, It is unlikely I will be able to retrieve the remains of fallen warriors in such perfect condition. Even bridge crew killed by flying shrapnel look a lot worse than this. 
can't think of any scenario where we could retrieve fallen comrades with such perfectly intact bodies. There is one, Shivia said, her words slow and deliberate. She was still looking into his eyes, and she saw that he hadn't guessed. She would have to spell it out for him. There is a rebellion, she said, and the penalty for rebellion is death. He gun drew in a sharp breath, at last starting to understand. We are talking about mass executions on an enormous scale, she continued. Even if most of the death sentences are commuted, even if we only end up killing 1% of the rebels, that is a massive pool of subjects for this procedure. I see, Hagan nodded, the true enormity of Shivia's plan finally starting to dawn on him. And there was something else, she said, her voice dropping to almost a whisper. The subject, after the procedure, is unfailingly loyal. They follow orders with no thought for their own safety, or their own skewed moral compass. This compliant is a drone. One of the monitoring devices hovering above the woman on the bed beeped attracting Shivya's attention. She summoned a hologram screen and checked the data it presented. Lovely, she said with a smile. This one is done. She adjusted some input fields on the hologram screen with a few taps of the finger and stood back, motioning Hagon to do the same. The woman's eyes opened and she sat up in bed, her blanket sliding aside as she did so. She wasn't wearing the sort of smock Hagon had been expecting, Instead, she was wearing a navy uniform. It was the usual gray, but it lacked rank insignia. Shivia put a small helmet on the woman's head, a strange thing with ventilation grills and readout lights. All the lights flipped from amber to green as the helmet made contact with the woman's head. Welcome back, Sherion, Shivia said to the woman. How do you feel? Optimal, the woman sitting on the edge of the bed said, her voice an emotionless monotone, as Shivya turned her head and smiled triumphantly at Hagon. Isn't she perfect? Shivya said, moving her hand so that her fingers touched Sherion under the chin, gently lifting and displaying her head. Still with all her years of study and experience in biology and nanotechnology, but without all the independent thinking and treacherous leanings that had built up over the years. The ideas that got her condemned to death as a traitor. Hagon watched Shivia, assisted by a gaggle of robots, get the woman to her feet and run a few precautionary diagnostics. Hagon had to admit, he liked how disciplined Sherian looked in her navy uniform, admired how she remained completely silent unless specifically asked for information. There was something very rigorous about it, something that all military training aspired to, but never reached. But despite the aesthetic appeal, he still felt a sensation of unease in his stomach. If this was the future, then he had to find some way to make his peace with it, or he wouldn't be part of it. He knew enough about Shivia to know that. His brow furrowed in thought. This would, he said, be reserved as a kind of extreme punishment for traitors, I take it. There is no question of using a technique like this on a loyal subject of the Empire. Oh, of course, Admiral, Shivia answered, her voice smooth and reassuring. This procedure would be reserved for traitors not for loyal subjects of the Emperor. Shivya looked from Shirion to Hagon and back again, seeing the admiration in his eyes for what she had achieved with her experiments. Would you like this one? Shivya asked. She is capable of setting up a lab on one of your fleet science ships, where she could carry out this procedure on traitors that you capture or discover, and whose skills you would like to have access to after their execution. This one what? Hagon asked the feeling of unease rising in his stomach again. I'm sorry, Shivya said, confused for a moment. What do you mean? You called her this one, Hagon said, motioning at Shirion. What is she one of? What are these things? Ah, yes, of course, Shivya nodded. Many cultures don't believe a thing has existence unless it has a name. Did you know that, Admiral? Hagon didn't reply. Anyway, Shivya continued. I suppose these things do need a name, if they are to exist at all. Any ideas, Admiral? I suppose, Hagon said. Some amalgam of technology and humanoid would be in order. How about... Techanoid? Perfect, Shivya smiled. Henceforth, the subjects who undergo this procedure will be known as Techanoids. But that doesn't answer my question. 
Would you like to take Shurian with you and take advantage of her ability to create more of her kind? Shivya looked into Hagon's eyes as she asked this, trying to gauge his enthusiasm, or at least his lack of calms. I would, Hagon said, with a curt nod. Then he continued more formally. And, thank you for choosing me for this honor, Lady Shivya. Well, you seem to have selected yourself by turning up here unannounced to confront me. Shivya said, her voice low and threatening, but the hint of menace was gone almost as soon as he thought he had detected it, and she continued on in the same friendly tone as before. But, as I say, I like that about you. Initiative and all that. But now, even though your visit has been an absolute delight, it is time for you to go, Admiral Hagon. Hagon nodded again. Of course, Lady Shivya, I must return to my duties. Excellent, Shivya said, as she turned back to her hologram screens. Take Shirion and a squadron of swift destroyers with you, and Admiral Hagon. Bring me back that drifter ship, all right? As you command, Hagon said, and turned on his heel before stalking out of the room. At Shivya's command, Shirion followed. Shivya watched her newly created techanoid go with an expert, an appraising eye. Shirian's movements were very natural, almost impossible to distinguish from somebody who had not undergone the procedure. A lot of refinement would be needed, but Shivya was sure that, in time, she would be able to carry out the procedure and produce a techanoid with no scarring, no heatsink ports or cybernetics in the skull, and only trace amounts of Z-mass. They would be almost indistinguishable from a normal human. She smiled at the thought with a cater of such capable and unflinchingly loyal supporters behind her. She could use the uncertain times of the rebellion to seize the empire for herself, and her grip would be unassailable. At that thought, she smiled even wider. The Dritcher ship was moving more slowly than usual in an attempt to keep their stealth shield integrity high. They were entering a technologically advanced system and they didn't want to have to fight or flee just yet. They had more delicate business first. It's beautiful, Nave said, looking through one of the hexagonal viewports of the observation deck. He was looking at a habitat, hanging in space, on the very inner edge of the system's Oort cloud. It was a huge barrel of technology, with the delicate human settlements shielded inside. It's quite an old and limited design, Altia said, but it has the advantage that it is quite out of the way, perfect for a secret meeting. We're almost within range, Jay told them. We can go to the teleportation chamber whenever you're ready. Altia, Nave, and Jay went to the transportation room, where Altia called into being a large hologram of the interior of the habitat. Jay waited a little apart, by the door, just watching. So, Nave said, you told me there was a good spot to teleport in. Yes, she said, raising a finger to point at the map. This is the maglev station nearest the property my parents own on the habitat. If we teleport here, we can approach along this path, like any number of visitors have in the past. I've used the path many times myself, when I was a kid, going into town to run errands and meet friends. Okay, Nave nodded. Let's do it. He drew his gun, patted his armor badge to make sure it was still there, and went to stand under one of the glowing hexagons of the teleporter. It'll be strange to see the old place again, Altia said. We must have spent dozens of holidays here. Let's just hope there are no distractions, Nave muttered darkly. Like that bounty hunter on my home planet. Jay watched them both shimmer for a fraction of a second. Nave with his gun already drawn and his eyes darting from left to right, while Altia simply stood there, resolute and at ease. Then they were both gone. Good luck, guys, he whispered, and turned and went back to the bridge. Nave's surroundings, the familiar dimly lit teleportation chamber, a mix of somber bronze shades and the rusty luminescence of the teleportation hexagons, shimmered for just a second, and then completely disappeared, seamlessly replaced with a pleasant, rural landscape. The surroundings were mostly trees and bushes, of a type Nave didn't recognize, with pleasantly graceful branches and large, shady leaves. The sky above them, he knew was simulated, 
but it was the best simulation of a warm, late summer sky he had ever seen. There were just two structures in the view, among the natural beauty. Behind them was what Nave recognized as the maglev station. It was raised on giant columns above the landscape at this point, and the maglev rails extended from an opening in the front, and another at the rear of the long, narrow structure. The other building was ahead of him, a massive structure visible above the trees, even at a distance. It was an attractive design of raw, concrete slabs. The slabs were so thick and monumental that, even to Nave, it was obvious concrete had been chosen for its aesthetic appeal, rather than for how inexpensive it was to build with. It's a palace, Nave whispered, his eyes widening and his gun lowering as he gazed at it. Hardly, Altia snorted and started along a narrow track that led into the trees. This way, she added, flinging the words at him over her shoulder. Nave hurried after her into the woods. There were no soldiers or law enforcement anywhere. In fact, he couldn't see any people at all. Or robots. Or drones. He hosted his gun block, deciding it was possible Altia's parents hadn't betrayed them. Maybe they hadn't called the Empire the second after Altia had contacted them, after all. It's amazing, Nave said, as he came level with Altia. It has a certain retro charm, she nodded, but she didn't elaborate. Nothing about what Nave saw around him looked retro to him, and he couldn't even tell if she was talking about the environment within the habitat or her parents' property itself. They'll know we're here by now, she said. It's strange, but I'm really looking forward to seeing them both. So much has happened, you know. I know, Nave nodded. It was so good to see my brother again. It really affected me. More than I was expecting it would. Up ahead, they saw a road, and parked on the road was a grav transport that looked to Nave to be a strange combination of luxury and practicality. As they approached, the door of the transport opened. Altia slipped into the back seat without hesitation, and they followed her as close behind as he could, somehow frightened that, if he hesitated, the door would slam behind her and she'd be whisked away without him. But the door waited for him to climb in and join Altia on the back seat before closing gently behind him. The car pulled smoothly away and headed for the palace. Nave was slightly shocked to discover that there were no other families living in the huge concrete mansion in the woods, just Altia's parents. Altia confidently led the way through the house to a huge living room with a view across the pleasant landscape. There was a severe-looking man there, sitting at a desk, surrounded by hollow screens that slowly dimmed as Altia entered the room and walked towards him. Nave followed as the man stood up moved out from behind his desk, and came to meet his daughter in the middle of the room. Altia, he said. It's good to see you. Father, she replied. Good to see you too. Altia's father's eyes then went to Nave, then returned to his daughter in an unspoken question. This is Nave, she said. Then she added defiantly, We're together. You are, Altia's father said, a clear note of confusion in his voice as he turned to look at Nave again. I'm pleased to meet you, Nave. You can call me Kayama. Pleased to meet you, Kayama, Nave said, instinctively extending his hand in greeting. Kayama did not shake the hand, just glanced down at it, then back up at Nave, looking him appraisingly in the eye. Nave was aware that this was a calculated slight, but he was also aware he was in an arena, where he didn't know the rules of battle. He decided to bide his time and observe Kayama, who he was rapidly coming to consider an enemy, after just a few seconds of contact. What are you wearing? Kayama asked. Is this some kind of rebellion uniform? No, it's not, Altia said, without explaining any further. So, you've heard that I'm in the rebellion. I did hear that, Kayama said, though I had hoped it would turn out not to be true. Where's mom? Altia asked, interrupting him and looking from left to right, as if her mother might be in some corner of the room, up until that moment, unobserved. There are some matters at our estate on the fourth planet that required her presence, Kayama said, and Nave wondered if Altia could tell it was a barefaced lie as easily as he could. That's a shame, Altia said. I wanted to talk to you both, about all the changes my life has recently gone through. There have been plenty of those, Kayama said, 
looking pointedly at Knave. I certainly want to hear about them. Why don't we sit down and have a bite to eat? Nate was standing beside a sofa and bent his knees to sit, but before he could, he saw that Altie and Kayama were walking away across the room. He quickly straightened his knees and followed them, wondering if they'd noticed. Please do join us, Kayama said over his shoulder to Nave. Don't mind if I do, Nave said. I'm starving. Altia giggled and her father stared at him a second, trying to gauge the intent of his words. Nave's quite informal, Altia told her father, still grinning, then added. It's refreshing. After all this... She hesitated, looking round the huge, luxuriously furnished living room and the dining room as they entered it, where a long table with a centerpiece was waiting for them. Pretension, she said at last. Pretension, her father grunted, through gritted teeth, his voice low and threatening, the pain the word had caused clearly audible. Maybe pretension is too harsh, Altia corrected herself before taking a seat. Her father sat down in the chair at the head of the table. Altia to his right, and Nave now had a decision to make. Should he wait to be offered a seat? Should he sit beside Altia? Or should he sit opposite her, at Kayama's left hand? In the end, he decided to sit beside Altia, and she rewarded him with a familiar and lingering touch, stroking down his thigh and cupping his knee for a second. It was hardly erotic or intimate, but it sent tingling waves of excitement through him. What would you like to eat? Kayama asked Nave. What have you got? Nave responded, making Altia giggle again. Why don't we have something simple, she said. The kitchen can whip something up from protein cubes. Protein cubes, Nave repeated, unable to completely hide his surprise. It didn't seem posh enough for the surroundings. They're a local delicacy, Kayama assured him, his tone withering. Chapter 10 Altia was in the extensive garden surrounding the house, standing under a tree she hadn't stood under for years, but a tree she knew very well. It was the most prominent feature of the West Lawn, providing shade beneath its beautifully proportioned boughs. She remembered birthdays celebrated beneath the tree. She remembered playing with friends. She remembered reading in its shade, both for her studies and for pleasure. And now, she was standing beneath it with Nave. She turned her head to look at him, smiled and reached for his hand. They embraced there, beneath the tree, and it was acutely aware that the tree could be seen from the house, that anyone watching, and her parents were always watching, would have a ringside seat for her display of intimacy with her new boyfriend. She took a long look at him, even as they embraced, his unkempt hair and the goofy grin on his face. Did he ever take anything seriously? She found herself grinning back at him. Then she noticed his eyes, which had been looking deeply into hers, had slipped away from her. He was looking at something over her shoulder. She turned to look, but she didn't see anything at first. There's a small shuttle on its way to our location, Nave said. I see it, Altia said, just then picking out a bright spot against the pleasantly blue sky, like a star seen in daylight. For her to be able to see the new arrival at all, she knew it must be approaching from the direction of the system primary. The simulated sky was always pointed towards the center of the planetary system, and it amplified their star's output to produce the facsimile of a sky above them. Those drives are hot, Nave said. Our visitors aren't making any attempt at stealth, Altia said. They could just have easily approached from the edge of the system, and we wouldn't have seen them. So who do you think they are? Nave asked. More bounty hunters? Maybe, Nave agreed. It's a small ship. Can't be much bigger than a hyper shuttle. How long before it gets here? Altia asked. Quarter of an hour or so, I guess, Nave said. And we don't know for sure that it's coming here because of us. Both Altia and Nave snorted at that, and then they laughed. I'll go in and say goodbye, Altia said. She disentangled herself from Nave's arms and walked across the smooth, rolling lawn to the house. Nave watched her go from the shade of the tree. He pulled out a communicator and called the galaxy dog. Jay, do you see the incoming shuttle? Nave asked. Got it, Jay said. Don't worry, I can have you out of there whenever you say. Great. By the way, that's me and Altia, so I guess you're next, Jay. 
I don't understand, came Jay's voice from the communicator. What do you mean next? Both Alti and I have now visited someplace important from our past. Now we should visit somewhere important to you. I don't have anywhere important, Jay told him. The woman who created me, my mom I guess you could call her, if you were being sentimental, she was in the military. She moved around a lot. There wasn't a place we shared. Not like this. Not like a real home. I mean, look at this place, it's perfect. It sure looks perfect, Nave said, now leaning comfortably against the tree. But my place wasn't like this either. I'll think about it, Jay told him. You do that, Nave smiled, curious, despite himself, to see what the robot would come up with. Long minutes went by, with the house just sitting there, immobile, in front of him. She's been in there a long time, Nave suddenly mumbled softly, but his words were picked up by the communicator. Ten minutes and counting, Jay said, and your visitors will be there soon. Should I go in and hurry her up? Nave asked. But he didn't get an answer to that question. Instead, he saw the arriving shuttle much more clearly than before. The approaching spaceship has been cleared to directly enter the habitat, Jay said in his ear. That's unusual. It is? Nave asked, uncertainly. Oh yes, Jay told him. Mostly, people have to dock in one of the main bays, disembark, and carry on to wherever they're going, within the habitat, using local transportation options. The habitat just opened a port in the hull for these guys to fly in through. They only do that for really big cheeses. This certainly isn't just another bunch of bounty hunters. Great, Nave muttered. I know we were going to pretend we just arrived at Altia's family compound on the monorail, like anyone else, but in case we do want to forget all that and just teleport out of here in a hurry, you're still in range, right? I sure am, Jay assured him. Don't worry, I can snatch you out of there at the first sign of any trouble. Well, okay, Nave said, sounding somewhat reassured. I can see that incoming spaceship pretty clearly now, he added. It's already passed through the port they opened for it in the habitat's protective shell. It's a Terrazin Navy ship, Nave said. Not a dropship or anything, though. Just a shuttle. The ship came down directly toward him in a steep dive, before leveling off and descending the last few meters to the ground vertically, using their grav engines. The spot it had chosen for its landing was halfway between Nave and the house. A ramp started to immediately deploy. Nave didn't change his location. He just stayed where he was, unmoving, leaning casually against the tree. Not because he was feeling particularly casual, but because he was too tense to reposition himself. Frightened, the slightest movement would attract the attention of the shuttle's sensors. Two marines, in towering nine-foot suits of power armor, descended the ramp. Each was armed with a powerful mass driver. Nave knew that, with their combined firepower from the mass drivers, just those two troopers could reduce the huge house to rubble in a surprisingly short time. Unlike the bounty hunters they had encountered before, the troopers were a formidable threat. Nave's attention was distracted from the soldiers and their guns by a voice from the house. Altia had appeared at the door and was descending the steps. You're making a hell of a mess of the lawn, she yelled. The faceless, helmeted head of one of the marines glanced down at where the huge, two-toed feet of the suit of armor that looked for all the world like the cloven hooves of a demon, were leaving deep dents in the surface of the lawn. And that was nothing compared to the mess the shuttle was making, as its undercarriage settled into the relatively soft ground. So it'll take decades to put right, Altia continued yelling as she approached the shuttle. Altia's parents appeared behind her in the doorway of the house, but they didn't follow her, instead staying near the purely psychological safety afforded by the walls of their home. Two more figures descended from the shuttle, this time armored only in slim suits that conformed more or less to the normal proportions of the person wearing it. Nave had no idea how well the two marines in power armor were, or even if they were male or female, but he could get a much better impression of the two new arrivals currently clomping down the ramp in their slim suit boots. One was obviously male, while the second was female. The male had a suit with a lot of strips of precious metal gilded into the surface around upper arms, chest, and shoulders, denoting a high rank. Definitely something above captain. Maybe some kind of admiral, Nave decided. While the other uniform, this one worn by a female, had no rank markings at all. 
The Admiral took off his helmet as he reached the bottom of the ramp, and Altia immediately froze. Her mouth, which had been opening to yell more criticism at the Marines, busy tracing Deep's cars in the lawn, simply closed again, wordlessly. The Admiral's eyes lingered on Altia as he absently tucked his helmet under his arm. This must be the famous Hagon, Nave muttered under his breath. That's an impressive entrance, Jay said in Nave's ear, making him wince in annoyance. Altia walked away from her parents towards the man. Hagon, she said. Altia, he replied. What are you doing here? Altia asked. I was in the area, Hagon said, and your parents contacted me. They are still citizens of the Terrazid Star Empire, Altia. Did you think they wouldn't call the authorities and inform them that a leader of the insurrection had asked to meet them? We should be thankful it was me they contacted. There are many other ways this could have gone. Altia turned to look at her parents, who met her gaze defiantly, holding on to each other for support. One of the leaders of the rebellion, Altia said, but also their own daughter. Altia turned away from them and continued walking out. As she walked, it became clear that she wasn't walking directly towards Hagon. She was walking past him, towards the tree. One of the marines instinctively looked over at the tree, and Nave chose that moment to step away from it, emerge from its shade, and show himself. Both marines raised their mass drivers, and Nave had the uncomfortable feeling, more than a feeling, an absolute certainty, that both guns were being pointed at him. Nave felt the oily feeling spreading across his skin, the feeling he knew so well that meant his armor had detected a threat and was starting to deploy, but some instinct made him fight it. He wanted to stay human for this encounter. He didn't want to suddenly become a monstrous metal statue as hexagonal plates slid to cover his body. His armor was no longer a simple metal badge attached to his chest. It had grown in the blink of an eye to resemble a chest plate, and it had started to cover his left shoulder as well, when he finally imposed his will and stopped its advance. Don't shoot, Hagon said. 